This meeting is being recorded. Hi, this is uh, Jack Lovanier, co-chair of the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force, and I'd like to propose that Stephen chair the meeting and I can step in as needed. And I apologize, I'm at my other office, so I'll have my camera off some as I'm working. Are, is there any other proposal besides Jack's for, for chairing the meeting? No, but I second that motion. Jill, do we need to vote on this or is this just... It sounds proceed? like approved by consent, which is just fine. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Then let's start with the land acknowledgement. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiamu people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. So I'll call the meeting to order uh, formally. Um, everybody uh, should have your agenda. Um, and uh, the first topic on the agenda, well, first of all, are there any additions or proposed changes to the agenda? Okay, the first topic uh, that we have listed is IPRTF communications, increased public participation, and an update on the communications contract work through Pyramid Communications. That was going to be led by Barry, uh, except there are some policy issues on uh, public comment, um, public participation at our meetings, and Jill, I think you probably are the most uh, uh, informed person uh, on that part of it. And we'll tackle the pyramid update uh, matter uh, when we finish public participation. Do you want to uh, introduce that topic? Yeah, sure. If you have your packets with you on the first page of the packet are some draft public comment guidelines for your consideration, I can screen share the packet, if you'd like me to, just let me know. Yeah. Arlene, I'm seeing head nod. Okay, let me screen share this right quick. Okay, do you see this here? So this is um, my first draft. If you guys want to take a look at this and provide some feedback. You so can, can I can I interject here for just a moment, Jill? I'm sorry to interrupt. Of course. Um, I think the reason this is on our agenda is because we had a couple of attendees at our last task force meeting um, who were drawn there by the increased communication and in particular the increased social media presence that we've started to have through the Pyramid Communications consulting work. So these people are not that familiar with task force work to date. Um, and uh, there, there's an issue of, do we engage in back and forth communication, uh, especially in terms of the accuracy of opinions they may be posing or in response to questions they may be asking. And I, I think that's what, uh, drew us to uh, uh, take a look at, at guidelines for this. Uh, okay, Jack and then Arlene. Yeah, I just wanna say, I, I think we obviously need these. Uh, and you know some of the things like not going into the back and forth because at the last meeting, because we had no policy, we had quite a bit of that. And clearly if there's a simple answer we can give, for example, if someone in their public comment asks when our next meeting is, giving that date would be appropriate. But it's not a time for, in my mind, for a debate or exchange or other ways and forums to do that. Um, I think these are 
great. Um, I, I'm sure if there's a couple amendments to, that people have, I would support them. But in general, we definitely need something because we need to be able to point to it. And uh, we anticipate having more public here. And as a, a co-chair of the task force, I don't want to be in the position of relying on my own judgment at any given moment and risk the <laughs> public wrath. So having a consistent uh policy seems wise to me to to incorporate. Thanks, Jack. Arlene? Yeah, um, immediately upon speaking, I regretted what uh, my response. It was really emotional. And um, all this time I have yearned for us to have public comment and people attend our meetings so that they can know what's going on. So uh, I do apologize for my response. Um, unnecessary, but uh, well received, Arlene, thank you. Um, I, I will say also add my own comment here. Um, I am on the board of commissioners for the Bellingham and Whatcom County Housing Authorities, where we have a public comment period and a policy of not responding at all. I, I frankly find that extraordinarily awkward at times. It, it's as if we're asking people to comment and they're trying to engage with policy questions or so forth. And, and we're saying, we can't talk to you or we won't talk to you. Um, so I, I think there are two ways to look at this. And I, I think having the clarity of a policy is, is important. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Perry. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Stephen, and I and I tend to agree. I, I mean, to the point that obviously I don't think that. Well, I, I'll just speak for myself. I certainly don't want to speak on behalf of uh, the task force, the steering committee, or 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 anything else um, at that point. But acknowledging and appreciating that the individual took a time to share, uh, I think personally is very appropriate. But response in kind, uh, I think, is as uh, Jack had made reference is uh, difficult you know in the in the time frame that honestly would be allowed and and not necessarily a consensus and so uh, i think that you know acknowledgement and, and recognition of the individual and um and then uh you know it being limited to something along those lines thanks perry uh, so I'm going to recognize Jack and then Raylene and oh. then I'm also going to recognize that we uh sort of uh stole the gavel from from Jill and, and even getting into the research she did. So then we'll go back to Jill. I just, I, I'm kind of reading those first. I just wanted to point out that this does allow a little bit of response. The chair may provide brief factual information. And I really love the part about offer an opportunity to contact us via phone or email. And Stephen and I have been great about that. So I don't think any of us want to invite the public and then give them a cold shut door. Like we are inviting opportunity to interact. Uh, and I think that's very much important. And I appreciate that was there. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Raylene. Sorry, earlier I was having technical difficulties and um, I'm still not sure what I did wrong, but I'm back. Um, on time considerations, I think there should be a time limit for individuals. I think there should be um, some respect to at least acknowledge them. I agree with everybody else's comments so far, but you know, when there's public comment at council meetings, I know for Blaine, it's uh, everybody's allowed three minutes to speak. Um, I think as we get into um, more advertisement and more social media, I think we may end up with more individuals wanting to comment at the meetings. We may have more feedback um, in which we may not have enough time to let everybody speak. And in that respect, we may want to come back and say, okay, we're going to limit it today because we have 10 people that want to speak um, and open that up to another uh, comment period. But I think allowing uh, at least three minutes per person, as long as we don't have a large group wanting to respond, is not unreasonable. Thanks, Raylene. And Jill, let me turn it back to you. And thank you for all the uh, groundwork you laid here with with the uh, what what you're showing on the screen. Oh, you're welcome. I was happy to do it. Um, 
the idea I think is to finalize um, the guidelines and then put them forward to the full task force for integration into the bylaws. Um, I think that's our end goal here. And you're right, Jack and Raylene, um, that really this is in response to us hopefully, um, well, a, success, a successful campaign from um, Pyramid and, and their, if their work is successful, which I really hope they are, that we'll get a lot more engagement from the community. And so I think this is just preparation for how best to um, make sure everyone is heard and um, how we can all handle that gracefully for everyone. So do you want me to walk through these one by one or do you guys want to look at this on your own time and provide feedback via email? What is your what is your preference here? My preference is to move to recommend it as is to the full task force unless people have edits or if they want to send edits via email. I've reviewed it and I think it's fine to present to the full task force. I would answer the question about how much time and uh, I accept Raylene's suggestion of three minutes and allow the task force or committee to extend the length of time. If you only have two people, there's no reason not to. But in general, I think it's um, unless there's other questions, Jill, I think it's ready to send to the task force and I hope we get it there. Yeah, so item number two is more about, um, because typically we schedule public comment at the end of the meeting. Oh, sorry, Perry, I didn't see your hand raised. Um, so if we start, if we allot, for example, 15 minutes for public comment, um, and um, we have so many people who, that would take up more than, than 15 minutes, right? So that question is about then do we cut it off? and ask people to submit their comments in writing, or do we go past the end meeting end time? So that's what that question is about, is to kind of clarify how that would be handled. For instance, if 50 people showed up and, and we give them three minutes each, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna run some time. So that's one thing to consider. Um, let me get down here. And I think the rest, yeah, so I think, that's the, those are the only outstanding questions then would be how to handle that situation when we do have a, a lot of folks. Um, Perry? I was uh, thinking along the same lines as uh, you, Jill, that you don't necessarily know. I mean, there can be attendees that may or may not want to speak. So there might be a dozen people there but you still don't know, okay, how much time is that going to take? And I'm not sure, you know, I don't have a recommendation in that regard. It just that the nuts and bolts of it, you know, um, to be a consideration for that and putting in that, you know, in that much time, I don't have a good suggestion of <laughs> how to handle that. Executive Sadu? Yeah, my, my, my suggestion is on all of our experiences that in council meeting, sometimes we start at six till nine we are just hearing public comments and meantime the council members get exhausted us what we were going to discuss as committee we gathered for it gets really really a short time and yes no keep moving this and that i think that's not fair uh, to the whole function of this committee what they are considering they are so absorbed and uh, and and deliberating, we are asking for public input, but not uh, them as uh, a seat on the table. A lot of people assume that when they get the microphone, they have a seat on the table, and they want to 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 do more than giving a suggestion. I think thirty, even make it forty-five minutes, uh, three minutes, then you have covered that but then you can get on to your business. Now allow people to send emails and, and engage in another way, or they can, you can say that if you wanna engage with an individual committee member, uh, 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 maybe provide that provision, that way that person can actually comprehend what this person is trying to say and bring it to the rest of the council. Hey, I got these couple of good suggestions. Because so many times what I feel people are talking about, we have already considered. They are, what their suggestion, we have already know that this won't work for different reasons, but we cannot say that because I don't think that we should engage with them answering that, or we have already considered. 
it will just open such a Pandora's box for that. So, but allowing them to talk to somebody individually could, could allow them a platform for, for the committee to get that in the valuable input we needed. Thank you. Great, thank you. Mike? <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for that. And thanks for pulling that together, Jill. And it seems like you research these fairly well. They come kind of from the way that we see a lot of, of, of committees meeting. I just want to highlight that this is a committee group of citizen volunteers, mostly. And many of us don't have the ability to continue to extend. And so what I want to balance is the desire to hear from everybody. But I have to be realistic and that my day job continues the moment this scheduled time ends. I would be unable to attend and to have us have a, a thing that can continually go on or as Executive Sadhu has mentioned, and as, it is very true, it can go on too long. So I think figuring out what is the right space and time and then setting that forth and then being transparent about that. And I love the suggestions and I think I heard it from two or three people about offering many ways. And Jill, I've even heard you mention it before, but other ways to reach out to the task force because it's possible we may not within the scope of our meeting time be able to accommodate all verbal you know, comment directly to task force members, but we wanna hear all of it. And then my other point that I wanted to, and thank you for calling on me was just to bring up, I think that's part of what I was hoping to talk about today about steering's role that we could be, uh, you know, the the kind of responders to comments that either need response. Um, I've heard mentioned maybe pairing up with a steering committee member to talk to that person outside of the meeting, which would be great in some situations. And again, I think we need to vet or vest steering committee with that, um, with kind of that that guys to do so. Um, so I'm hoping that we get to that today. But I but I would be in favor of having a set amount of time, having as many people as fit with that two minute time frame or three is if that's what the committee decides. Um, and then we would have to cap it and then we encourage further participation and the other means. Thank you. Jack. I think I'm up. Yeah, uh, I think just from an efficacy perspective, we've been meeting since 2015. We typically haven't had more than probably four or five public comment, even when we met in person. I, I'm thinking in the rooms when we had 20 people sit, stand, you know, sitting there, different community members, lots of good input. It rarely went more than 15 or 20 minutes. I think we all agree if members of the public come, we want to make a space and a time to hear from them. But I also think so far this hasn't been a huge issue. And one thing that occurs to me from a facilitation perspective, is we don't have to put it as the absolute end thing of the meeting. So for example, in a two hour meeting at the 90 minute mark, if I see there's 15 people in attendees, and typically we have committee reports at the end, maybe we move, we just allow public comment to be adjusted. And if that becomes consistent, then we have to allow more time or figure out how we do it. But I don't know that we have to plan for everything today, knowing if Stephen and I find ourselves with 10 members of the public that want to speak, we can make sure that meeting that that happens. Um, the committee reports can go out via email or we could ask for highlights. So that would be that would be my thought. I understand we can't necessarily extend, but I don't think we're also bound to always have public comment at the end, particularly if we have a large group of people that want to speak. And if that becomes a regular thing, we'll figure it out. So those would be some of the facilitation things I think we can do to make sure the public's heard and balance that with the needs of having the meeting um, and respecting the time of everybody there, including the public. Great, so I can, one option, you're right, Jack, is to amend number two. So it says similar to number three, it is that the length of time for the public comment period will be at the discretion of the chairs. Exactly, and where we put it on the agenda. And the only reason Stephen or I think, I'm sure you agree Stephen would move it, is to allow the public uh, the opportunity they need to. The only reason we would adjust it is to uh, hear from the public. That that would be the reason we would change something. And one typo here, I see I put council there instead of task force in the bullet point under number two. So I will definitely fix that. Sorry about that. Um, I think to move forward, if anyone has any amendments, um, please suggest those. And then if you feel like it's ready to go to task force, um, we can do that as well. Can we see if everybody's cool with the time and then uh, Stephen and I having the ability to adjust the length or move it in the agenda with those amendments? Are we good for sending it to the task force? It'd be my question of where we are. 
And and I think I I would prefer that we specify uh, an amount of time, and I, I I would suggest fifteen minutes for public comment period, uh, subject to Jackson my discretion, uh, both with the order, the agenda, and I, I mean I. That works for me, Stephen. Going forward, that historically that would have worked at practically every meeting, and if we need to yeah. adjust it later, we will. Yeah. Executive Sadu, uh, a very quick comment that, uh, uh, which may or may not be suitable here, is ask the groups, people who are talking the same thing about that somebody has already talked about, to refrain. Or sometimes there are activist groups uh, because this is going to get. Uh, a bit more attention than what you had before. So there, there could be some activist groups coming. Uh, advise them that if you are 10 people, you can all stand up and put your hand up and then let one person speak for you. I think that if we put this kind of restriction, we can help them and help us. We see this every time happening. 10 people, 15 people coming, saying the same thing again and again and again. Great suggestion, thank you so much. So um, what I'm hearing is number two, we'll say length of time uh, will be 15 minutes unless decided otherwise by the chairs and then, or unless the task force votes to extend it. Um, is there any objection to that? No, okay. Jill, you've sort of written this in, in your parenthetical second part to apply to committee meetings also. Um, mm. So that's something we haven't specifically touched on in this discussion. Um, it makes some sense, but the language you just said would be limited to the task force, so. Right, thank you, Stephen. I will make sure it, it encompasses committee meetings as well. Okay. And uh, oh, sorry, Ray Raylene, I see your hand up still. Just going back to if we're looking at 15 minutes for a committee meeting and the legal and justice subcommittee is only an hour, um, that that may really take a lot more time out of a uh, presentation. So I think that's where we allow the chairs to say we're going to have to cut um, the time limit short today because of the presenters. We're only gonna allow two minutes per person, but we'll be happy to make sure we get your contact information so we can respond to you at a later time. I think that's those are the committee meetings that we're gonna to wanna to maybe shorten it just so we don't run out of time to discuss the material at hand. That's a great point. And I think that's why it the policy should be clear that the discretion of the chairs as facilitation uh of the meeting goes forward uh is is really the determinative factor thanks great okay everyone thank you that's uh fantastic okay thank you jill so jill um, just to clarify this will be on our agenda at the task force meeting in march coming up for approval great uh, yes thank it you. will for sure perfect thank you so much everyone Okay, the next item on the agenda is composition and role of the steering committee. We got a little uh, uh, insight uh, from Mike there, and, and Mike's going to carry this forward. Thanks for that, Stephen. Um, really quick, I wanted to add, too, you know, if we get, much to Raylene's point, I mean, obviously, sometimes those subcommittee meetings are pretty packed. If we start getting lots and lots of folks, um, I wonder if we could consider then adding a listening session. You know, I think um, as a and as Executive Sadu has mentioned, we may get groups that are really interested. And rather than trying to hem it into really narrow meetings, you know, we could do something like an ad hoc, hey, we're getting a lot of feedback. This is a great time to add a listening session. So I would just like to offer slash suggest that if we find ourselves in meetings and not able to get to all public comment, that we create pathways for um, for that type of feedback. Because I think that's the key thing is that it wants to come off like that's what we want and we're welcoming it. We're also just trying to realize and make it fair and make it just and make it equal across our meeting times and spaces. So 
Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and start, and I believe I can share my screen. So what I'm going to share with you is a draft. Is that is complete draft, and I think. Um, let me know first if you all can see this. Share. Can you all see my screen? Is that an okay size for folks? No, my eyes like it big. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So um, what I decided to do is just kind of draft this. I will speak to it a little bit. So this is just kind of a draft document for us to just have a conversation today. Um, and as you all remember from our last steering committee meeting, thanks to Jill, who dug up the history on the creation of the steering committee, both the motion that did it and also the surrounding text. So I won't read every line, but the current status of steering basically covers just that. It talks about that it was created in three of 2016 and um, established essentially to move the work of the task force forward, um, discuss task force subcommittee process, meeting goals for the task force established by ordinance, and to clarify and discuss the role of, at that time, the Waha contracted facilitator. Um, this next paragraph is kind of where I begin a little bit of my soapbox. Over the time, the role of steering committee grew to encompass setting the agendas for the task force, including brief reports from subcommittee chairs, uh, which we think is congruent with the language from the discussion. Um, and I did in this document, by the way, is the entire history that Jill dug up for us. So this is the meat kind of of what I'm bringing forth. And again, this is a draft. So you know I can send this to all of the members afterwards, but this is just an idea of growing up the, the, the first concept about some changes to steering. So the first of it starts with really trying to align because um, we will have to vote on this as a task force to make this, um, that the steering committee can actually do these things. So this is my drafty draft uh, verbiage. So the mission that, um, uh, the task force steering committee in coordination with the task force is to create agendas assist with moving the work of the task force as a whole and its subcommittees forward this is new and responding inquiries and coordinate responses steering members together with whatcom county staff will conduct meetings following requirements of the open public meetings act other duties may include and i chose to do this as a bullet but we can work this however um, assuming that people um, choose to expand the role Coordinate working communications with contractors, such as the Pyramid Communications contract. Coordinate support with county staff for twice yearly task force reporting. We are currently doing that with Jill Nixon and, and other folks she may bring along. Strategize the Whatcom County Executive and designee on legislative advocacy and associated reform efforts. We started doing that a bit this year. Coordinate and conduct outreach for members and representation from special populations, including marginalized communities. This is kind of uh, one of my pet things, and I would love to see this happen. I think this comes to me from my understanding and reading of the GARE uh, racial equity tool, which is really we look at our makeup. Um, and this is what forced me to, to, to look at the, our role in composition. I think steering um, should have a role not only in creating its own representation, but also um, filling vacancies on the task force itself. There are vacancies that have been there for quite some time, and I think we need to do outreach efforts to fill those. And I'd like to see the steering committee uh, accept that charge. And then the last one, together with the Whatcom County Executive, ensure the work of the task force, composition of leadership and membership, and communication with the public is informed by GARA's racial equity tool. We appreciate the leadership of the executive and the executive's office at, uh, with the racial equity tool. Um, and then if you all can see here, I'm scrolling down. The second part of my document just has a couple ideas about how we might change the committee roster. So the first five that you see or uh, the existing makeup is, is kind of created by, by the first vote. Staff is kind of added, but I think that's almost de facto understood. It's not actually in that language. Um, and then the proposed additions, and these are just some ideas that I had and things again that I had by looking at the racial equity tool Community members with lived experience, we are very fortunate to have a co-chair with that, but we may not always have that. And I think having a stated position for somebody that might choose to represent us that way uh, could be really valuable. Uh, tribal representation, I think is really important, um, especially as we're dealing with multiple governments and we have good representation from other governments. So I think tribal representative would be key to have a spot. Law enforcement representative, this one I brought up, I think so much of what we do has to do about that and it would move the work of the of the steering committee forward to have that knowledge um, at the site. 
um, at our meetings, I'm sorry, BIPOC community members, as we know, um, um, marginalized folks, but especially BIPOC folks, are most likely nationwide to experience disparate treatment, right, or, or unequal treatment, if you will. Um, so really crucial to have them at the table where the agendas are being set and reform efforts are being set. And then the last one is acknowledging that we've been very fortunate to have Perry Maori for most of our meetings, but that's not official and he's great and he's here all the time. We really need somebody from the Whatcom County Health and Community Services Department as a, as a stated um, piece. I, I don't know, sometimes I don't know that we would move forward without the likes of Perry and other representative um, from Health and Community Services. So I'll stop there. That's my draft. These are just some concepts. And again, I can share it out and, um, and I'll go ahead and stop and turn it back to my chairs. Okay, thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate the work you put into this and the thought that uh, underlies it. Uh, Jill, you had your hand up first. Yeah, sure. Just a couple of clarifications. Um, Watkin Community Health and Community Service Staff Representative Perry sits on the steering committee as chair of the Crisis Stabilization Committee. So he is a member. We can uh, formalize a representative from the health department um, separately also as well. But I just wanted to let you know that Perry is officially a member. Watkin County staff, if that's referencing me, I am not a member. I just talk a lot. Um, and then up above a little bit, uh, Mike, if you want to go up to your introductory paragraph. Um, oh, down. So where it says admission statement draft right there, the, the last sentence about OPA, um, we can either, we can definitely leave that in just to make sure people know that is a requirement of the of the committee anyway, as according to code. So it's not um, necessary that that be in there. That's it. Thank you, Jill. Chad. So as probably most of you know, I was there when we started the steering committee and it was uh, needed at that time because Jill and I couldn't figure out what to put on the agenda. We had so many pressures from different people we didn't want all the heat ourselves. And we asked Ken Mann, who was the council representative at the time, to give us clarity because we served the council and we wanted to make sure the agendas conformed with what the council wanted. Uh, at that time, initially it was three. And then when we started using subcommittees, we thought, well, it makes sense to have them there. I like the changes to steering as it relates to uh, the other duties, including. Um, I have concerns about the additions because by the time I add it up, we've got about a 16, 17 person steering committee, potentially. If you could scroll, Jill, so I could see the additions. Let me give you one example. Both Jill and I, and I think Stephen, have done outreach to tribal members, trying to get a tribal representative to regularly show up just as a member of the task force. So I believe anybody on the steering committee should be a member of the task force in general. I don't see a role for non uh, task force members to be on the steering committee. So to me, the, the first level of putting someone on the steering committee of the task force is they're a member of the task force. So I don't know, you know, we've reached out to people. We did have one representative that came for a while. Uh, that's been a challenge. I, I guess we could talk about which law enforcement representative on the task force would best fit, but I think these have to be aligned better to current task force positions uh, because I, it doesn't, to me, make sense for the steering committee of the task force to include individuals who aren't part of the task force. They wouldn't typically have the breadth and knowledge and information that's uh, necessary. So um, those are my thoughts. I'm absolutely in support of the idea that we have lived experience, that we have representatives, a BIPOC representation, and that we are as diverse as we can be. But I think the pool that we're using for the steering committee should come from the task force. And I think we have to balance the desire to do this with a certain degree of nimbleness. I don't know that a steering committee of 15 or 16 people makes a lot of sense for a task force of 30 people. Um, so that's, or, or 13 people. I've, I've been doing the math a couple of different ways and it depends if it's members. But at, at some point you've created a second committee as opposed to in my mind was what was originally an administrative body to represent the task force for 
communication, contact negotiations, and the point of accountability to the council and executive. So those are, so I guess generally, generally speaking, Mike, I like the uh, outline, the way you've outlined the duties and so forth. I have some concerns about uh, this additional members thing. And I think for me, what would be helpful is to understand your vision of how many people you think should, that the task force should consist of, whether or not you think the task force steering committee should consist of non-task force members. And I would be interested in hearing if you think they should be non-task force or if it should be really big, how you see that uh, making our task force more effective. Well, that's excellent feedback. I would expect no less, Mr. Hovenier. As I was going through this list, I actually truncated myself because I started viewing unwieldy meetings. And I think you are correct. Um, it, it, it When it gets to like half the size of the task force as a whole, I don't think it would function quite as well. And, and so I did kind of stop myself at, at where it was at. I do think, and I'm not an expert in writing this, um, so I did volunteer to do this, but my thought was we have many people who are kind of covering multiple bases. So in some situations, for example, Caleb Erickson um, in the sheriff's office as chair of the index committee is actually employed in law enforcement, right? So we may have some situations and, and maybe if we could state things in such a way that we want certain roles done, we may have humans that may, uh, that may be able to have one, two or three of those roles. Um, Two, I would just let you know I'm actually not a task force member. So <laughs> um, one of your folks here in steering and has been here for some time and I volunteer and do a lot of work for the task force. I haven't done that. There's no other reason other than just getting around to it and wanting to make sure that members and that there were slots open for other humans other than me. I also knew that by being a volunteer to be a co-chair of the behavioral subcommittee would make my presence here um, available. So as to having non-committee members, I would say that um, it, through other means that, that people become co-chairs, um, that might make sense to have them there, but I'm certainly willing to accept the will of the steering committee if that includes not me being here. That, that, well, that I'm, I'm, I'm accepting of that, but I, I'm not a member of that. Um, I, I knew that and I forgot, but I want to interrupt and clarify. When I say task force, I'm, I'm wanting to include the subcommittees and the active participants, if that helps. Okay, great. Because great. We, yeah, because that has been the a task. The task force approves those people that go on the subcommittees. So the task force says so. So in that sense, in my mind, they're part of the task force. So I'm okay. sorry I wasn't clear on that. No, no, no problem at all. No problem at all. That's 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 a great example. But as to Jack's um, query about the size of the meetings, I I will confess I was a little stuck at that. Um, and I think sometimes increasing representation and the visibility of things does make for more messy processes. And I don't, Jack, I really just don't have a great answer other than maybe having the idea instead of just like number of bodies, maybe we could look at the roles that we really want to be able to have or the perspectives that we think will be really valuable and maybe stating things in that way. So proposed additions could be, we want somebody with this lens, right? To be able to, to help the work of the steering go forward. Is that helpful at all in, in terms of, what I was thinking and where I was coming from and what the vision was. I really don't want it to be overly large. I think we're actually almost at the size at, at which it might become challenging. However, I also know that when with the changes proposed in the in the paragraph above, I do think it um, it does need some some representation. And I'm looking for a way to balance what I'm seeing on my screen um, every time we meet. I'll stop. Thanks for your thoughts, Jack, and for your uh, thoughtful responses. Mike, um, Raylene, you're next. Okay, my medication is starting to wear off, so I'm gonna start sounding like Rudolph, my apologies. Um, but I really appreciate all the work that um, Mike has put into this, and I think the thoughts and the efforts are great. Um, echoing some of the comments that Jack just made. I remember when this topic somewhat came up before is to include people from the tribe. Um, when I first joined thinking, oh, I know people from the tribe, I can get people to participate. And so I did bring somebody in and that individual ended up saying, um, I'm being restricted on what I can do by certain members of um, where I work. And I, 
um, am happy to be there so that I can get feedback and, and bring stuff back to, to let everybody know what's available, but I can't participate as much as I anticipated or would like to. And I think, I think that struggle's not necessarily going to go away. I think some things are going to be guarded and jaded because it is a sovereign nation and they're not going to agree to everything that are all of our missions and everything that we want to do. So I think there is going to be some struggle there, but I think the thought of using the gear tool on implementing some changes is definitely something we want to keep working at and looking at. And maybe it's not necessarily bringing in an addition to the steering committee. It could be, um, but it could be that we want to present something at the next task force meeting or at one of the other subcommittee meetings. And we want to bring in lived experiences, whether it be um, interpreter usage or um, other barriers that members have faced um, maybe that's something we can implement into one of our meetings so we're not leaving that tool or the representation out. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of thinking outside of the box and maybe um, I'm not coming across the way I intend to, but I'm just trying to not eliminate that tool or option as well as maybe rotating some of the chairs and some of the subcommittees to um, limit um, I mean, it's hard also to find people to be able to do these um, tasks as well. I, I know that talking to some of the law enforcement um, and court individuals that would love to be able to participate and add, they're very limited on the time uh, that they can give to these type of committees and these type of meetings. And we have a great representation, but we also want to keep them uh, those that are willing to help and to participate, um, we don't want to give them more constraints um, so that they're unable to assist in this. So we have to be very conscientious on how we're including people. But I liked, um, you know, when we had comments from the public saying, you know, that we're made up of a specific type and we were able to say, no, there's actually other members. Um, I like to be able to say, yeah, it's not just this type of graph. So I don't want to not include other individuals. I don't know if that helps or not, but those are my thoughts. Thank you, Raylene. Um, Perry, to you. Yeah, just really quick. Um, I, I too appreciate, Mike, the, <clears throat> the work that you had, had put into this and, and also the thought uh, that the steering committee is giving to, okay, as a role changing, you know, and what have you. One thought that I had um, when you had listed uh, law enforcement, huge supporter of law enforcement, I think incredibly important to have that representation. But specifically, I can't imagine not having a jail correction staff like Caleb Erickson or, or Wendy Jones, because that information uh, the experiences that they have and the information of the protocol within the jail, it, 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 we would so often, I think, be off track on things that were specifically related to that. So that's the only um, specifier that I would offer that I I, I think that that's a, a pretty crucial piece from uh, my perspective for the steering committee, um, to be honest. So I just offer that thought. Thanks, Perry. Arlene? Yes, um, the, uh, I've been thinking that the representation that seems so important to me is someone who has been in the jail system um, because we are making plans and changing things. And uh, that person would have direct experience. And I don't know if anyone is on our... Um, IPRTF, for whom that's true. Does anyone know that? Yeah, I am. Okay. I mean, All I've right. spent many, many days. I was sentenced to five years at Shelton and served nine months, and I've spent more than 150 days in the Lawton County Jail. So, mm -hmm. and, and there's others. Uh, so, yeah, we, we have that, and it comes up periodically. But I think that 
illustrates the reality that many of us have multiple hats. Mm -hmm. I get that I don't look like that person and I'm kind of happy about that. I've worked hard, <laughs> but, but, but that is my background in reality. Okay. From a substance use problem. And, you know, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, Jack. And thanks, Arlene. Jill. I was just going to say, um, Arlene, also Deborah Holly is our other uh, okay. member, the family member with lived ex uh, of a person with lived experience. So right. um, there are two of uh, those positions on the task force. I mean, Arlene, I used to tell the public, I thought it said a lot about Whatcom County that they picked a co-chair that had been to prison, you know, that had li literally lived the experience and then gone through the whole system with everything, because I think it showed a lot of trust and a commitment to try to do things differently. Yes. So I'm going to exercise the chair's discretion and add my own comments here. Um, I, I share the concern with us having too many people to be a deliberative uh, body. Um, I, I like what Mike has sketched out in terms of our scope of work. And so when I look at that, it's clear to me that we are guiding and coordinating, we are steering a, a larger body of work that the task force does. So to my way of thinking, we don't need every perspective that we want on the task force mirrored into the steering committee because we're not really ruling things in and out that they'll never see the light of day if, if uh, the steering committee doesn't uh, put a stamp of approval on them. So I, I think, you know, while I want tribal representatives, while I want people with lived experience, while I want law enforcement people, um, there's a quite a range within those uh, groups as well. Uh, do we want the sheriff's office experience? Do we want the jail staff experience? Do we want Chief Tank's experience or Chief Mertzig's experience? Um, so I, I, I think maybe we're trying to do a little bit too much in terms of the composition of the steering committee and in, in reflecting uh, multiple viewpoints, multiple experiences, um, because most of what the steering committee does is going to then be filtered up to the task force and dealt with with an even more diverse body there. I, I, I think it puts increasing pressure on us to uh, uh, to be compliant with the racial equity toolkit and and to be consulting uh, affected communities and, and representatives of those communities um, to have diversity, have greater diversity than we have on the task force. But I'm not sure all of that needs to filter down into the structure of the steering committee to quite the extent that Mike's first draft here um would shoot for um so i'm satisfied with the scope of work um i'd like to keep us a, a, a you know a, a body of a size enough that we can we can have full and and uh, uh varied exchanges in in our own discussions um i guess that's where i'll stop my comments as well um, I, I had a quick uh, please on that. My comment is that how many are the people when we say subcommittee chairs? It's more than one person. We have two oh. subcommittees that partly to share the load because uh, okay. people have other lives that we have co-chairs uh, okay. the same way we do as the task force. So I was thinking that we can limit ourselves to seven people in the steering committee. Uh, uh, and and uh, 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 county staff can be additional, but seven people uh, who are steering committee voting members and uh, staff as needed. Uh, that should be pretty good decision making body to to do what we are charging them to do, and. Uh, and I agree that it doesn't have to be representative of our task force. Uh, let's let's see, because it's it's expedient uh, to, to interact with the 
accounting government and could be money matters, could be contract matters and things and having uh, myself or, or Tyler uh, can give you ready answers most of the time. Things that we as an uh, uh, executive's office do. And if we have to go to council, that's a separate thing. But from that, I think the presentation is, is, uh, is about seven people and staff would work pretty good. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Sadu. I'll, I'll just note that uh, you yourself or Tyler as your representative uh, and Council Member Buchanan are members of the task force. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Jack's idea the steering committee is, is task force members uh, or people like Mike who've been endorsed by the task force in that role. Uh, Raylene. You're muted, Rayleigh. Yeah, I'm, I'm having issues. Um, <laughs> so I, I like the idea of keeping it smaller because I think you're able to accomplish more, but there are times that uh, Maya has joined us on the steering committee and there are times that Tank has joined us on the steering committee. Both of those members are not chairs. Um, Arlene and I feed off each other. There's times that I can't be here or Arlene can't be here. and and being able to be present to make sure that one of us knows what's going on when we have to forward at the next meeting is, is definitely beneficial. Uh, but having those different perspectives sometimes from individuals that are on other subcommittees um, that would be beneficial to chime in, I don't necessarily wanna limit that and, and say that they're not able to participate on the steering committees because there are times that it's needed to have that that expertise in certain areas. Um, I know Maya's on a couple different subcommittees that it, it's been helpful and, and so is Chief Tank. So I, I just don't wanna limit it down and then not allow um, pertinent members to be able to participate when needed. Well, and I, I, I think I read Mike's uh, draft and, and really the way we've operated as there, there are members who could vote if we needed to vote, but they are open meetings and, and I too have welcomed Maya's contributions and Chief Tank's interest and there have been other people over time uh, who want to sit in and, and there's no problem with that, there's no problem in their participating and I do think they influence the collective thinking on whatever it is we're talking about, so I, I, I agree that's valuable. I don't see Mike's proposal or or some pared down membership from Mike's proposal as as an obstacle to that kind of participation because I do agree that's valuable. Mike, I've been ruminating since Jack brought that up because he hit on something that I was thinking on my own as I was drafting it that you know at a certain point you can become kind of unwieldy and not quite as functional as you would like to be and as he and as he had rightly noted everything from here goes into the to the task force for full ratification anyway so it's not like anything would would go out from under i i want to propose a little slightly different tack but that might get at the same piece so as i told you one of the reasons why i even brought this to you all was because i think it's a way it's a way of enacting kind of our values and you know recommendations from the racial equity toolkit, but it's not the only way. And another thought that I have that I just wanna bring up to you all is maybe, and in the roles I think I put in there, if the steering committee could then play an active role in a recruitment. So there might be multiple ways to look at diversity in our membership, representation in our membership. And if steering accepts the charge for aggressively pursuing vacancies and making sure that our list of stated vacancies by charter is filled, we will in another way, right? Maybe it's not in the steering, but we will in the work of the task force as a whole, increase that diversity. Um, and you know, I think while steering certainly could talk about it, we are not active in any way that I've seen in terms of recruiting membership. Um, we've acknowledged many of us how it might be challenging to, to bring people in, but I think that could be an important role of steering is looking at its membership, caring for its membership, and seeking membership from those that that um, is is really germane and really crucial to the workings of it. So, in deference to Jack, I think it's a good idea in terms of keeping our size workable. 
But then what is an alternate plan to increase representation, to increase diversity, and to increase the space for different voices? So I just want to throw that out that maybe, Stephen, and what you're saying, you liked the writing of the proposal about kind of the, the, the duties of the steering. Um, I believe it included one about making sure that our, our that those are filled. And maybe we at another meeting then look at the slated seats. I know that they are created by charter, some of the um, the, the specified seats on the uh, on the task force. And we could propose, for example, to look at that in a future meeting and make sure that is still fitting the needs, look at those key vacancies. And if we agree to, we start designating people and steering to go recruit. So I'll, I'll just posit that, throw that out there. Jack, thank you for thinking about that because I think you might be right. We might get so unwieldy, we'd be like half the task force. Well, thank thank you, you, Mike, for your voice on this. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I think this has been, a, I, I think, a, a very rich discussion. Um, and um, I'm looking for guidance from you on where we're at with Mike's draft or a next step, next iteration. Jack, I knew you would have some thoughts. Well, I'd like to suggest we expand a little bit. I, I think the initial narrow focus of the steering committee made a lot of sense. We needed help and we wanted direction from the council. We were brand new and really it existed just for agendas. And I think what Mike did a great job of is capturing in his list primarily what we're kind of already doing. Maybe some we aren't doing quite as much, but it wasn't like he listed anything new particularly. You just articulated what we've kind of already fallen into as best practices. And I would think memorializing those in some way for future people would be helpful. Um, obviously, we all seem to be in consensus. We want as much diversity as is reasonable, balanced with some efficacy. I don't know how to accomplish that one. But at least on the function of the steering committee, I think memorializing maybe Jill could, um, if she's willing, massage it in a way that works in our uh, guidelines or bylaws, whatever we call them, I think that's really useful and I think it should happen and um, I hope we do it. So my suggestion for the next step forward would be if Mike's willingness to work with, because Jill's really good at getting it in language that conforms with some of the legal things that not all of us understand in the same way, because we are volunteers and incorporating that. But I, I think your basic points, Mike, I, I agree with all of them. I think they're, and, and primarily they struck me as, wow, he's done a great job of seeing what we're doing and listing it. So that would be my thought. Thanks, Jack. Jill? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to work with Mike to massage language. And um, as much as you need help with Mike, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I also want to take advantage of, of Executive Sidhu's presence here today to remind everyone that I'm part of my role in the council office is to work on recruiting for all, uh, all county boards and commissions. And so I've anxiously, very anxiously been awaiting the formation of the racial equity commission so I can engage with them on how to make those improvements too. So um, just keep in mind that that's another angle that we're approaching for um, increasing diversity. And I'm having been one of the stakeholder group for the for proposing the racial equity commission, I've been tracking that a little bit and I will say uh, I think that will have value. Uh, the Racial Equity Commission will have dozens and dozens of, of focuses uh, uh, proposed for it to take up and it will have limited scope of capability. Also, they're just starting to vet applicants for that. So I, I think that's down the road and I hope we don't wait on that. Um, I think Mike continues to push us in the right direction um, at uh, with all deliberate speed, as Brown versus Board of Education said. Um, so uh, I, I, I hope we can take some initiative of our own on that without without waiting too long, and then pick up partners along the way when when they're in place. Um, so I think what we've got, if if no one disagrees is that Mike and Jack will polish up a, a second draft of this, uh, capturing our conversation. Um, I think you meant Jill, not Jack. I'm sorry, Mike and Jill. Well, Jack and um, Jill, we get confused all the time. That's it's, true, it's that's true. My Jack, my you would be welcome. Your wordsmithing, I'm sure, would be amazing. <laughs> um, 
And so uh, I, I think maybe the best course would be to bring that back next month and, and we'll finalize it and send it up to the task force for formal adoption. Does that, does that sound appropriate to everyone? Okay, good. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try to share my screen and get back to the agenda. The lo and behold, the next, next topic is uh, what Mike referenced, which we don't have to wait for because it's on today's agenda. I'm sorry, Mike, did you want to say something? The only thing that I wanted to make sure, and, and I, I can let this go, I feel like Ontario wrote the newspaper on this issue, but with the representation piece, if we could at least like state like at a future meeting, we will look at the composition vacancy partner with Jill to, to look at that representation, because I think it really is missing. And while adopting the changes, and as Jack rightly said, I did try to just encapsulate what we're doing. I wasn't putting new tab, new duties on there. But I feel like we're not addressing that piece. So I just wanted to just mention that. And if the if the steering committee would like to put that on a future agenda, um, I think that's a good way to kind of handle, you know, not putting, not augmenting the number of steering committee members, but agreeing to say, hey, it's really important and we want to continue to, to work on that and talk about that. And then I'll stop. And Mike, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying the representation on the steering committee itself. Is that correct? No, I was thinking more broadly. I was okay. thinking of my second thing, which is kind of after what Jack had mentioned, that we look more broadly. So it is kind of taking it up a level and not necessarily saying that the only way that we can get increased representation is by augmenting steering. But what it is saying is that steering agrees to take the charge to look at that in a really serious manner and to look at filling some of the vacancies that have been there for a long time and not expect Jill to do all of that lifting. And, and thank you for that clarification, because as I looked at the faces when you made that point earlier in the discussion, um, I, I assume that draft two of this would include that as one of your bulleted uh, other duties may include. Um, but taken. Perfect. I'll do it. Okay. And Jack, go. Completely different topic, Stephen. We inadvertently, I think, missed the pyramid update. I can give a 90 second one because we're, we're running short on time or Jill could, but I, we probably should say something about it. We absolutely did. And thank you for catching that. Uh, would you? Well, I wanted that? to wait for this discussion to end. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you go ahead and make that update? Uh, really and, quickly, and Jill, I, I'm going to try to be very, yeah, I'm going to try to be brief because we have a few more items on the agenda. But uh, earlier today, uh, Jill, Stephen, and I met with the Pyramid Consultants, uh, Barry is in Nashville. And they updated us on uh, the efficacy of their efforts. Uh, some of the highlights included about a 3% rate of unique people seeing um, task force information or clicking through to the task force website. We have about 250 followers. They are fine tuning those efforts that seem to disseminate and communicate our information best. They are, uh, they've been reasonable to work with. They're open to uh, what seem like what I would call best practices, and they are fine tuning things as uh, they roll some things out. That is, that's kind of a high level oversight. I'll simply say too, my background as a person in business and marketing is overall, um, I'm reasonably pleased with the efforts they're making, the metrics they're using, and the results they're sharing with us um, because they're measurable uh, and they're uh, have been responsive when we've had some concerns. Uh, a simple one was when our meeting time was posted half an hour after the meeting started, that won't happen again. But and there have been up a few others. So um Sakara has been great, Emily's been great. And I think our goal of at this time letting members of the public know more about what the task force are doing is enhanced by their efforts. So that would be what I've got on that. Thanks, Jack. Jill, anything you want to add? That. Uh, yeah, just going back to our previous discussion right quick for our one attendee, I just wanted to clarify that the, we don't really have any long term vacancies on the task force for the public in general. Our current vacancies are specifically for the two tribal representatives and the peace health representatives. So I just wanted to clarify that. And in addition to pyramid, we have op eds coming out in the Bellingham Herald and the Seattle Times are coming up. That's coming up um we and we have been tomorrow's the herald and the times is this weekend yeah, yeah so. and uh we've had a couple of glitches with facebook post postings we're fixing that i've been in contact with malora and some other staff 
Um, and we're fine tuning that process right now. That's it. Great, thanks, Jill. Um, and Arlene and Perry, you had questions or comments. Um, uh, Jack or Jill, <laughs> would you, do you have any suggestions or um, that you have for Pyramid, something that you'd like them to do um, or pay more attention to? I would say not yet, but that's emerging. As we find where they're most effective, I think we definitely will. One of the things I'm loving, Arlene, is they're seeing what messaging is generating the most interest, the most click-throughs. And I think also when we click through to the task force website, we may want to think about what's on the headline there as well. So my answer to that is not yet, but I'm sure we will. As Because it's almost like right now we're driving the car to see what it can do. And then we're going to figure out some of the destinations we may go. Because the overall goal is to share the information about the work that's being done to improve our systems and how to best do that, we're still figuring out. Thank you for working on this. Um, I feel like it's so vital to what we're trying to accomplish for the public to have a good understanding, um, to have it simplified for them. I find uh, it enormously frustrating to encounter people who have no idea whatsoever what's been done. And um, the explanation is, is um, exhausting to, to try to cover these things. So I guess we have to pick and choose certain items that will have the most pleasing, be pleasing to their ears. Um, but um, I thank you for, for working with them. I think the premise in part, at least as I see it, if you raise the consciousness in general, you're going to get better results. We don't need, I mean, if we can just get facts out there and get people more informed, we'll be successful. So then the issue becomes what facts lend themselves most to this particular vehicle and how can we share those facts most widely? So I, I think that, like there's not a lot of bad roads. There's questions of what are the best roads? What has the furthest reach? And that's what we're figuring out. Yeah. Thank you. Perry. Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, when we had a number of individuals that uh, were uh, attending the steering committee, you know, um, people beginning to respond. And so I think that there's some self-evidence, you know, in terms of the efficacy. Um, Jack had said to folks, hey, it's really simple. Go ahead and join. And I'm only in fishing groups. So, you know, I internally refused to do that when Jack said it. But then I thought that through a little more and said uh, that is something um, that I need to do. And I did. Um, thanks, Jill, for also mentioning. Melora called me. She was concerned just in terms of uh, it was honestly out of context as opposed to truly inaccurate, but, you know, that whole piece of being able to be under a microscope to some extent, and it's like, okay, if you said something that was inaccurate, whether it was unintentional or not, then everything comes into question, you know, kind of piece. And so maybe we don't have to discuss it here, but I would be interested in any information about, okay, so, uh, can we vet? you know, things, uh, not we, me, but, you know, is there some process of where that's being car carefully looked at um, just because of the crucial nature of the information that's being put out there and, of course, the individuals that are. So I think it was a great move. Um, I really felt for my boss because she, you know, these are, uh, uh, these programs are in their infancy and she wants them to be successful and I think needed somebody to talk to. So I was glad that she called me um, in that regard. So I'll stop there. Uh, and I know Seth Paul had also just touched base about what is that process, and and so maybe that's already been addressed. But um, I appreciated that reach out to Seth Paul. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, Seth Paul. Yes, I just wanted to something share something this triggered in my mind when you said pyramid communications and and what we are drawing doing to the outreach. Uh, one of the thing I'm trying to do, I think, which is important for you guys to know. Uh, because I don't attend all the meetings, is that I've asked the staff to uh, write a letter uh, not responding to the resolution proposed by Whatcom Dem Democrats, uh, uh, but I'm saying uh, that has so much information, which is from 2017 and last campaign, everything. I don't want to talk more about that, but there is 
a information or knowledge gap in common person about yeah. what stakeholder advisory committee did, how much pains we have taken uh, to get input, do a lot of different things we have covered. And it, it shows from their wording and, and what we have done that a lot of people don't understand that what, how um, intense of this process has been. So I have asked my staff to develop a letter uh, informing public and 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 once we have drafted, I will uh, I, I have shared it with Barry and he can bring it to this this forum as well. Uh, it's not finished; we just drafted. But I wanted to uh, make it so that we can get to the other media, the means to the um, uh, Cascadia Weekly, Herald, some bloggers, or whatever. I think we need to inform, there are some misconceptions out there and before they take hold, uh, I think we should, we should uh, uh, be ahead of that curve and, uh, and put out our information there. So I, I'm making that attempt and uh, Barry will share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Sidhu. Um, I wanna make sure that we're clear that we're leaking a little bit IPRTF business and SAC implementation business together here um, with that resolution. But uh, just to let you know that the implementation team of which Tyler is a central part um, is probably a couple steps or a couple drafts ahead on a similar statement that we're, we're uh, about to disseminate as well. And, and we're just talking about the final details of that. So there will be some attempts at course correction and in, in public awareness uh, yeah. on that front as well. Um, Arlene. Yeah, I think it, uh, it's sort of shocking to me that um, Cascadia Daily and the Herald are not following our activities in great detail because that would be an opportunity for the detail to be able to be in those columns and the fact that they haven't assigned somebody to cover this, but they cover other things of much less significance mm -hmm. is really stunning to me. I, I, I just, I, I, I mean, some while ago, I approached um, um, the Cascadia reporters with this, but I, they dropped that ball and I haven't gone back to it, but um, I just think um, the coverage the the detail coverage would be really good. Arlene, in all fairness, Ralph Schwartz, uh, who is Ralph Schwartz with, Jeff? Harold, Harold I think. No, 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 no. He, he was Harold. He he's Cascadia Daily. He's Cascadia now. Yeah. yeah. He, he's and, a, and he's, a, a, he's attending, yeah. he's attending many of these meetings uh, and and is, is in the middle of a three-part uh, series of articles. I, I think there's limited yeah. capability for detail, but but I think they are trying to track this stuff. You know how 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 much the the readership is is uh, grasping uh, is is an open question. But uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, Jack, thank you for bringing us back to the pyramid update and the communications questions. Um, and uh, I think I'll move back to where we are on the agenda, which is the fourth item. And that was the point Mike was making earlier, um, taking a, a, a closer look at the current state of task force membership and also uh, the leadership of the task force, since we're, we're facing a situation where in less than a year, both Jack and I at, under the current ordinance term out of our membership and the task force altogether, and therefore as, as the leaders of the task force. Um, so I, I put this on the agenda. I don't have a lot to say about it other than that I notice, uh, I, and, and I won't get the numbers right here, Jill will correct me, but I think we now say we have 28 members on the task force, whereas we have 32 positions or something like that. I notice we haven't had a, a, a Peace Health representative at a meeting for 
seems ages to me. I think we've dropped off their radar screen. Um, uh, and there are a couple of other uh, designated members who are not really active participants in the work. So um, to me, there's a question of how, how full a membership do we want, whether the membership categories, which we made a little more general, less specific to particular organizations, whether, whether we want to review that, whether we want to have a policy on, on uh, what level of active participation qualifies to retain a seat uh, or, or an appointment to the task force. And, and then that question about uh, uh, future leadership for the task force as a whole um, are things that I, I, I don't want to let slip too late in the year because they're worthy of, of a fair bit of discussion um, and thought uh, amongst us. So uh, I asked to have this put on mostly as a placeholder just to kick off some, some thinking amongst ourselves about those questions. And Jill, I'll let you carry it on from there. I just wanted to let you know when you're thinking about the membership of the task force that the state RCW requires uh, certain specific individuals to sit on the task force because uh, it's also functions as the Law and Justice Council. So the state code says Law and Justice Councils must have person A, person B, person C um, specifically. So that's um, one thing just to keep in mind is that regardless of attendance, we're, we might be required to keep some of those positions on the task force. And, and most of those RCW designated people for a Law and Justice Council come from institutional represent, representatives, law enforcement, the courts, so forth. And, and I'm, I don't think we have too much problem in those areas. It's more the community members, the social service agencies, uh, those uh, kinds of citizen representatives in a way who, who have one foot in their own professional camp and another foot uh, in the task force camp. Um, but I, I, I wonder whether we're sustaining them or their interest is being sustained well enough. Um, so not, not much uptake on the, the conversation on these areas. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what, uh, is this not timely in people's minds? Am, am I fretting too much about how quickly the year will pass? Uh, um, without without dealing with these topics, somebody tell me to settle down. I, I don't know what to say, frankly. I think the leadership issue is really tough because um, that person, those people, uh, need to devote uh, a lot of time and energy, and and need a certain knowledge to do that job. So I'm really not sure who would want to and who could do that. That's one dilemma. Um, uh, so yeah, leadership, that's, that's really huge to me. Thanks, Arlene. Jack? I brought up a while back with Stephen that because of we came on at the same time, we will term out at the same time. So that from a leadership perspective, that's not ideal because you're losing both people simultaneously. Um, not being sure how much longer I want to do this, it's been a while. I believe it's better for the council and committees to have the ability to do what they think is best rather than to be bound. Currently, the uh, ordinance that established the task force tied the terms to I, I forget what the ordinance is, but 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 a different ordinance that talks about terms. And that that other ordinance says, I think you can have uh, two four-year terms unless the enabling ordinance, the original task force ordinance says something different. Given the permutations that we serve as the Law and Justice Council and given how many of the 
task force members or permanent members, my bias would be that the council would have the prerogative to make four-year terms for task force people at, 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 at their discretion. I'm absolutely fine if they don't do that as well, but it seems to me a better practice. Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from on it. And I think um, that would enable either Stephen or I or someone to do a, a shorter term or some term with that. I mean, I think it'd be Stephen if it's a, if it's a co-chair thing, but I, I don't know when you have willing people willing to serve, the council's still going to choose. And I would hope that for the principle of rotation, and other voices, if they've got multiple people applying for these seats, they're gonna select the people that haven't done it before that want to do it. But to automatically preclude because of a, a term limit that doesn't need to exist and you have people that have been there again the whole time because that's appointed, um, I, I don't think is a best practice. So those are, those are my thoughts on it. Thank you, Jack. Perry. No, really well said, Jack. It was honestly in in much more eloquent way, uh, most certainly what I was thinking. Um, obviously, um, the two of you terming out at the same time. I mean, that that's a mistake, um, in my opinion, uh, uh, by just by virtue of the fact that the momentum, the knowledge, as you know, Arlene was saying, that this is fairly sophisticated stuff. There's a lot of pieces that have to be held. And um, passing, you know, if if it was an individual that was interested in it and, you know, has demonstrated some of that knowledge and so forth, fine. Um, but otherwise, it, it does seem to me that in terms of, you know, consistent with the ordinance that um, if the uh, county council has uh, the um, obligation and, and, and willingness, you know, in terms of, you know, continuing to appoint as opposed to for, you know, one reason or another, just because it sort of runs out. Um, so that that I think that, that would be a mistake um, and taking a look at that. So not also to keep people in um, the position and the responsibility for, you know, um, inappropriate extended periods of time because, you know, there are other things that um, folks want to do, you know, as well. So um, I think that it is a concern, Stephen, and I appreciate the fact that it's being brought up, you know, at this point in time because it'll be gone the time frame will be gone in a heartbeat and then um, quick decisions are not always wise decisions, you know, um, at that point. So, um, so Jack got there before me, but uh, I wanted to, I'll underline that. Thanks, Perry. Um, Raylene. You're muted, Raylene. Seems to be a habit today. Um, I don't want to see either one of you leave. Um, so I, I like you both. I think you're both doing a fabulous job. Um, if it's discretionary and either one of you would like to retain your position for another period, that'd be great. If not, um, if we could at least have some overlap, um, if there was new people coming in, if we could have them a couple months prior to the end of your term and a few months after, I, I think that would be beneficial to help anybody that's coming into that position um, to take on this because it is a lot of work. The other thoughts that I think of is that we have um, elected officials that might be retiring as well in law enforcement positions or changes um, that have a lot of knowledge that have been here for a very long time. And uh, to have everybody term out at the end and then also lose some of that knowledge um, that we have without passing that gavel to somebody that's got that experience. Uh, maybe it's also something we wanna bring to the entire task force to say, you know, put on your thinking caps. Do you think of, can you think of anybody that um, would be able to replace you or that would be willing to dedicate their time to this um, because it's only March, but boy, time flies. Thanks, Raylene. Executive Sidhu? Yeah, I was going to say that for selfish reasons, uh, we need something at least until this implementation plan which will be past the ballot measure. It will continue after that. If we can, uh, we, we, we need continuity of, of this momentum and, and understanding. So my thing is that 
if can extend these terms by two years uh, beyond end of 2023 would be very helpful because that way, whatever happens, uh, we will be on our way to, to accomplish the next. Uh, I think you guys have done an excellent job and I don't want to embarrass on your face, but it has been a real pleasure uh, to, to see what IPRT have done since, because I was on the council, we did this, and how we have done an exemplary work as a community. It really exemplary work. And uh, especially being it's this conjunction of ballot measure and passing or not passing, I just would like to have more stability. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for those kind words um, and, and the thoughts behind them. Um, Mike and then Jack. It's really supportive of Executive Sadu's um, <clears throat> recommendation. I kind of made something similar, although it was a little bit off the cuff and it wasn't real measured in, in a response. I really appreciate the way he intimated. I think that's important for the work. I think it does depend on the willingness of these two people. Um, and of course, you get my deep appreciation too. The other thing that we could do during that time is deal with the problem that Jack so, so well put is that we have created terms that we didn't stagger them. And I'm kind of thinking that we kind of, if we could do, you know, both things, like, so if there is some changing of terms or extending to, um, to, keep some existing leadership on that we in the future that also address Jack's concern that we didn't stagger him to begin with. And so maybe, you know, somebody gets a two year term, somebody gets a three, whatever we do. And so that we um, are able to, to move forward well would be super. And I was hoping that um, that council member Buchanan would be here because I was going to pipe it into his ear. But thank you, Executive Sudu, for bringing it up. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Well, Mike, a long the last line that you touched on. Jill, I'm gonna ask that you direct Council Member Buchanan's attention to the last segment of the recording for the meeting so that he, he hears the discussion because I, I think ultimately this will fall into uh, uh, Barry's and Sat Paul's lap uh, as the council leader and the recommender and then the ultimate appointer of task force members. Um, so, I'm, I'm glad uh, Executive Sudu was here to take part in this and, and like to bring Barry up to speed on this as well. Jack, your thoughts. Of course, thanks for the kind words. Um, it, with extended terms, I wanna let you know that Stephen has agreed to take the longer of the two, um, just, just to clarify that. I do think though, and one of the reasons we brought this up because we've both been invested in this for a long time as have many of you, it does seem in the interests of the common goals we all have to have some stability uh, through a little longer period than would naturally occur if we didn't do this, because it seems we're kind of at a place, it's never good to change, um, I don't mean this egotistically at all, but it's never good to change effective leadership as you're being successful. And, and we are at a place where that's where I think, yeah, we're looking at that. So that's my thought. Thank you, Jack. And seeing no other hands, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what the next iteration of this conversation, uh, how that takes shape. Um, so we have the next item on the agenda and I see that we are very close to being out of time. Um, Jill or I Jack? To get on to another meeting. Thank you very much. So please continue. Thank, thank you, Sat Paul. Um, yeah. Oh, Jill, sorry. Go ahead. Go I was going to say, I just, we're going to need to reschedule the April uh, steering committee meeting similar to what we did for this month because it conflicts with the workshop. So I will work with you guys independently to, again, try another and find another day and time that works for everyone. Thank um, you. And then Jack and Stephen, um, I think we have an agenda set for this May, uh, excuse me, the March meeting. And um, we can discuss April and April. I apologize. I've got a critical work thing I got to take. So I will see you all soon. Thank you for the kind words. And it's a pleasure to work with all of you. And Mike, thanks again for your comments. It was a great discussion. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing. Take care, Jack. 
So Jill, I take your comments to be, we, we will hear from you on the scheduling of the April steering committee meeting. Uh, we will work later on forming the April task force agenda. Uh, and that leaves us with planning for the annual report due June 30th. Uh, that's yeah, so just as a reminder, I'm not going to be able to fit that into my work schedule this year. And so we'll need to find someone to take that um, to help us out with that. But we can discuss that with Barry um, at a later time as well. Hopefully okay. soon because that June time does creep up on us. Yeah, so that maybe ought to slide to the next steering committee agenda uh, near the near the top. Okay, any objections to the way we've uh, skipped around those last three subjects? All right, um, and then we're at public comment. Thank you. Yes, we have one attendee today. If you'd like to speak to the committee, please virtually raise your hand now by selecting the raise hand icon. Go ahead, Michelle. Do you want to unmute yourself? Sorry, I didn't have my glasses on. I hit my re muted myself. <laughs> um, it was interesting, of course, I'm trying to catch myself up on what you all were doing with the task force, which is why I was steering committee can always give me extra light. Um, I did give out my email at the task force. However, I did receive um, no, no emails from anyone <laughs> about your past work or anything like that um, to try and catch myself up. So I do apologize on that, that I'm not caught up to date. Um, I did have something to say as far as your terms. You might try and do like two, three and four year terms. And then that way, if someone's in it on two years and they wanna do three or four, they can do it for a second one. But um, this kind of work as you all know, can be very um, soul sucking, <laughs> time consuming, um, very soul sucking and sometimes you get someone in there and they're like two years into it going and they're just mentally kind of out of it um just in my over the years in being in different steering committees and stuff so sometimes having a smaller one and then they tear off um helps <clears throat> my other question is how do i go about finding everything so i can catch myself up to date since i didn't get any emails about with information, how do I find this information? Michelle, um, I, let me respond to that. Uh, uh, I, I've been intending to follow up with uh, both you and your colleague uh, to, to try to touch base and answer questions and things like that. Um, so I do have your emails and- uh, Oh, there I, we go. I, I, I will get back to you. Uh, we'll, we'll try to work something out to-, to uh, provide some information, whatever you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. Cause I just know yeah. being in other yeah. committees, it's when you come in and some, everybody's been doing this for years. It's like, oh Lord, glad you're here. Just don't have the time to catch you up in, you know, 10 seconds on four years. I, I know that I know that happens, but I think you two are uniquely positioned to contribute to what we've been doing. And I'd like to give you the background and, and see where we go from there. Awesome. Um, did you need my email again? Uh, you can send it to Jill just in case. I think I have it somewhere. I'll have to dig through it from the last meeting when you did send it. All righty. And what's Jill's um, email address? Uh, you should have got, but Jill, go ahead. Thank you. My email address, Michelle, is uh, first letter J Nixon, N I X O N, at C O dot watcom dot wa dot us awesome. and I wanted to also let you know michelle um if you go to the task forces website web pages on the county website um there is uh there are a ton of information there's meeting recordings and meeting summaries going back since the task force uh its inception 
There are all of the annual reports and all of the initial reports that the task force was tasked with creating are on there as well. So I, as, as is my contact information. So I, I very much suggest that you go to the task force website and uh, check out that information there as a starting point for um, getting the background information. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I think that was the only public comment. And uh, so therefore we've concluded our business and uh, I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.